Um, I want to take you back to the first century, and I want to take you back to what some people consider the worst night in human history. The worst night. Uh, this is the night that Jesus was betrayed by one of his own. This is the night that he's going to be arrested by the state uh, in the garden. This is the night his own disciples are going to um, abandon him. This is uh, the night that uh, is going to prep for a kangaroo court and uh, just some, some crazy stuff that people think really was the worst night in history because it's going to lead to the crucifixion in just uh, a matter of hours. Kangaroo courts, craziness. Uh, this is the night a lot of people felt their hopes were completely dashed. I don't know what hopes you have right now for our country, for yourself, but if you can imagine feeling like it's all gone. Yep. <laughs> Some of you know that feeling. That's this night. And here's what Jesus said to his disciples on this night, recorded for us in John 16. Remember, the upper room discourse is John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's a little chunk of scripture of what happened on that last night. And in that text, Jesus says this. I've told you these things. In other words, I've been candid. He was thoughtful. He was forthright about reality and greed and betrayal and death and self-righteousness and vengeance. He talked about a lot of things with the disciples. I've told you these things so that in me, so that in a personal relationship with me, based on your personal connection with me, despite what any of the lobbyists or interest groups might say, despite what the civil government that night might do, and despite what insidious behaviors others may contribute, I'm telling you these things so that in me you will have peace. This is the worst night in human history for some people. But on that night, he says, you can have a peace of mind. You can have a, a peace in your heart. You can have a wholeness, an unshakable assuredness in me. Not in the externals, because they're going to get cuckoo. But you can have a peace internally with me. And then he said what many of you are familiar with. In this world, in this fallen, godless, call it liberal, call it left, call it power hungry, controlling, in this cruel place, you will have what? Tribulation. You'll have trouble. You'll have tribulation. You'll have trials. In this world, you're going to have sorrows and sufferings. In this world, progressive tense, you're going to have ongoing experiences of disappointment and difficulty. But, take heart. But, don't fear. But be courageous. But be brave. Some translators say, but cheer up. Uh, if I could fill in the blanks here, it would be like, you don't have to have an insurrection. You don't have to storm the capital of Rome. You don't have to be like the zealots of the first century. Uh, and you don't need to despair. I have overcome the world. I have defeated and conquered the world system. I have triumphed over the corrupt world order. Uh, the story's not over. We win in the end. A final reset is coming. This is what some people consider the worst night in human history. All their hopes were on this Jesus. And it's going to unravel in 24 hours. And he says, look, I've told you the truth many times. And I've told you that in me, you can actually have a peace. You can have that today, by the way. You can have a peace. 
in this world, I've told you you're going to have troubles, tribulations and trials. Crazy stuff's going to happen. But you can take heart. You can be courageous and you can be brave. Because you know I've overcome the world. You know I've overcome the system. You know I know how the matrix works. You know that we win in the end. Well, I hope that's encouraging to you. Um, today we're going to be discussing kind of a, well, what can be an anxiety producing, uh, scary topic uh, for many people. Um, it's a sober, serious situation uh, the world finds itself in. I want you to be encouraged and hopeful. I want you to see that these scriptures are still relevant and practical and true. And, um, well, that's going to be helpful and meaningful for us because if news sources are correct, uh, the world's powerful elite, if they get their way, are looking for some radical, complete transformations of everything we are and everything we do. Um, there's a number of people that we call maybe globalists from Justin Trudeau in Canada um, to the Pope, I'm told, to Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, to Joe Biden, who enjoy the globalist agenda. And uh, they all, by the way, have the same identical slogan. Build back better. We actually just had a presidential candidate who's now our president-elect have the same exact slogan as the world order. The same slogan of the globalists. And they see this current pandemic as a very rare, narrow opportunity to, in their words, reflect, uh, reimagine, and reset the entire world according to a new agenda. Uh, they call it the Great Reset. Uh, some of you familiar with this term? Is this something you've heard of? This term became very public in May of just this last year, May 2020. It was unveiled by Prince Charles of the United Kingdom and Klaus Schwab, who's the director of the WEF, that is the World Economic Forum, in Davos, Switzerland. And this is where the most powerful people in the world gather to offer solutions to the world's problems. Uh, the, the difficult part for you and me is everyone that's gathering doesn't know God. This is a gathering of the world's elite who have no biblical bl blueprint, who have no understanding of the nature of man like you and I do. Uh, these are people who repudiate objective truth but want to solve the world's problems and think they have solutions for us. Um, and they believe this current crisis is a great opportunity to make a better world. A world according to how they think. And I want to be as charitable here as I can be. I'm going to assume, and I hope you join me, that they're well-meaning. I'm going to try to assume, though I think some of them are nefarious, uh, that they mean well, that they actually want to do what is best for society. And I don't even know if you can imagine this, but if you took God out and didn't believe in God and you lived here, you'd still try to concoct some ways to try to make the world work. And I'm assuming, well, without God, these are some of their best solutions. Um, these one world ordered advocates believe that if we swiftly revamp every aspect of our society and economics from education to social contracts to working conditions from every country from us the US to China and they all participate in every industry from oil and gas to tech they can actually transform and achieve this great reset of really if you're if they're honest it's a reset of capitalism this planet-wide pandemic is something they now want to seize and solve what I think it looks like kind of a globalist socialist uh, agenda uh, to get your hands and your head around um, 
what they're calling the Great Reset. You have to think more like uh, the new Green New Deal, maybe the Green New Deal on steroids, <laughs> um, because it's the Green New Deal worldwide. Um, you need to think of like COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. You're going to have to think uh, forced redistribution. You're going to have to start to think about nationalized health care. Um, and what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution. This is um, in which technology is actually supposed to radically change the way that you and I live and work. One writer says this, simply stated, you'll own nothing. Energy will be green, rationed, and expensive. Travel will be restricted. Your diet will be controlled. Your currency will be digital. Um, and you'll supposedly love it. <laughs> Are you loving it so far? <laughs> you don't feel the love? <laughs> Anyone online feel the love? If you feel the love, go put a little heart emoji somewhere, maybe in the chat box. <laughs> if you're not feeling the love, maybe we'll get some thumbs downs or something like that. So my, my question for us is, okay, it sounds cool, a great reset. And quite frankly, some of us could use a reset. So if it's like a grand reboot or like a godly like reset or restart, I think, you know, the whole planet could use that. That sounds terrific. But if the Great Reset is really something quite different, if it's a grave revolt against the things of God or a godless rebellion, um, then we're in for a little bit of a riot. Um, it's, we're going to be in a ride because a lot of people are involved in this already. Um, the World Economic Forum's involved, the World Bank's involved, the World Health Organization's involved, the United Nations is involved, Greenpeace International's involved. Um, global companies uh, like, I think you know a few of them, Apple, Amazon, Google, MasterCard, Pepsi Company, Rand, BP, uh, all involved. Foundations like the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, all involved. Uh, individuals like Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, and you know, I can name others, uh, all involved in this globalist great reset opportunity. Um, for many of them, I, th I think they talk about it like it's going to be heaven on earth. And quite frankly, I've thought to myself, I guess if you don't have a God, and you're not actually going to heaven, then this would be a great, I mean, if this is your last cruise <laughs> and the Titanic is going down, uh, you might as well make the most of it. So for some of them, they, they think they really are creating a, an amazing world for us, a new utopian vision of a world that they think will be cool. They don't really believe in the sinfulness of man or the fallenness of man. So you don't really need police. Uh, you know, if people are basically good, but if they're basically good, I don't know why they want to be so controlling, but they just want to make sure their goodness is channeled in a very constructive way. Um, they're going to restrict speech because this is a world that you don't want any hate speech. This is a beautiful world where everyone's going to speak uh, nice thoughts. Uh, they're going to manipulate reality because there's certain things that, you know, are not helpful for people to know. They're going to be able to pull the levers of society so that um, everyone can enjoy. Uh, every snowflake can be uh, encouraged and no one has to deal with uh, yucky thoughts. Everyone can like, well, be happy. Um, I don't know. Am I watching The Matrix? I, I, I can't tell. <laughs> Dave's like, <laughs> I can't tell if I'm watching Minority Report slash Divergent or just an old fashioned Twilight Zone. <laughs> um, the stuff we're hearing is really provocative. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, of course, when you're dealing with people who know nothing about a heart transformation that is possible in a personal relationship with Christ, where the Holy Spirit actually animates and quickens the soul to love beyond our conditional limits, we can start to love unconditionally our neighbor. Um, 
and journey with people who are vertically oriented, not just horizontally, when you don't have that, uh, of course people need to be controlled. Of course some elites are going to have to decide what the good is for the people. Because the people can't think for themselves. They don't have transformed minds. People don't know what's best for them. People are dumb. They need the elites to discover for them. Um, and people, I suspect, somewhat sincere people like Marx had great ideas. We've just seen that uh, we've had a whole century or two to see that those ideas don't flesh out very well. Um, we studied Stalin in Russia and Mussolini in Italy and Hitler in uh, Germany for a reason, right? To see how those ideas fleshed out. Well, anyways, because uh, these globalists don't have a transformed heart um, in people, they're going to have to come up with a lot of rules and regulations, including like what light bulbs you use and, you know, all, all that sort of good stuff. They're going to have to come up with some PC protocols you're going to have to keep and uh, stay involved with. They're going to have to come up with some virtual uh, virtue signaling and standards uh, you need to know about, some compliance laws. Of course, we've got to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, what they're calling it is a new social contract. That, does, that sounds harmless, right? Uh, this new social contract aims to tie every person into it through an electronic ID linked to an individual's bank account, health records, and social credit ID. So if you do the PC things, you get points. Um, and it will end up dictating every aspect of our daily life. Of course, capitalism free enterprise is a real problem for this kind of system. So they're going to have new terms for us like sustainable development. That sounds cool, right? Code for something ominous. Stakeholder capitalism. Um, you're going to hear new terms because they see the world as having a global inventory and that inventory needs to be completely accounted for. So everything's going to have to be registered in a central database so we can steward the planet's resources really well. And then there'll be a readable scanner so everyone can be easily ID'd and we know where you are at all times. And it'll be managed by artificial intelligence, of course, using the latest science so that people can be managed and controlled so we can have this amazing new world order. Progressives and those who think that they're innovating progress, believe privacy, uh, will be a, a very expensive uh, thing. Dissent? I don't want dissent in the New World Order. Um, we want to get along. We want to be unified, right? And s spiritual submission, of course, is going to be mandatory. So churches and other faith-based people are going to have to, like, fall in line. Because the state is what controls it all. Here's what one writer said. It's like a 24-7 medicated reality, except the medications are both chemical and digital. And they are reporting you back to the mothership, which can then punish you for bad behavior. For example, they can block your access to certain places. Can you imagine that? Like you could actually get blocked maybe on something like Twitter or like Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Who's ever heard of this? This is crazy talk. Or they can put a hold on your digital bank account, whether it's with Wells Fargo or Venmo or PayPal or Zelle or TransferWise, because they have access to that. Perhaps without any human intervention at all, and without it, you'll have no ways or means of survival. Now, does this sound like a conspiracy theory? Kind of does, right? But is it? Well, it's like a bad 1984 model, <laughs> right? <laughs> Getting panned out. For those of us who are joining online and you're not in the beautiful state of California, um, you may not be aware, but our own governor, Gavin Newsom, has uh, threatened businesses here. Unless you obey the state, unless you do what it says, when it says, and how it says, they'll take your business license away. They'll shut you down, because they know what's best for you here in Valencia, 
doesn't matter if you're in Barstow, San Diego, or Stockton. They know everything about everybody that they think is best for everybody. And you can't think for yourself. You can't decide what is actually best for your business in the city you live in. Of course, uh, they've tried to shut down the churches in our state and many places around the, the nation. Uh, recently, those of us who live in the City of the Angels here uh, in Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti said, if we do not obey the state's orders, he will shut down your water, your gas, and your electricity. Right? Am I making this up? Right? Uh, you see, when, when globalists have their way, they have control over all all the avenues with which you do your living. And so if you don't comply, no problem. No gas, no electricity, you can't live at home. Refrigerator, everything's gonna spoil. You won't have any way to buy things because they'll shut down all your monetary access. Uh, you won't be able to say anything to anyone because your phone won't work. And your social platforms will be destroyed, like overnight. But this is what they're talking about. Technocrats, educators, politicians think they know what's best for you. Now, I've always been somewhat suspicious of big government, big tech, and big university solutions because they always figure the bigger they are, the more detached they are. Sometimes they're just outright weird. I don't know how to say it any better, but... Um, they're godless. Now, one writer said this, thought leaders, both red and blue, agree that over the past four years, Donald Trump has been the greatest roadblock for people who are pushing this international, internationalist, globalist sort of agenda. Okay, so that's relevant for us because we just had an election and there's kind of a changing of the guard that's occurring as we're talking. And a lot of people think one of the things that was a hedge against this new world order, this great reset, was the guy that just apparently got voted out. World elites at Davos are now elated that Joe Biden will give them the necessary green light for the great reset to go forward. English journalist uh, James Dellingplaying says the, uh, the great reset is worse than Nazism, it's worse than communism, it's worse than fascism, and these guys are planning on taking over the entire world. He says it's a Trojan horse for massive wealth redistribution, social justice schemes, and much more. Okay, as you know, obviously I'm a magistrate of the church, and I want to stay in my lane. And there's magistrates of the state, and I want them to stay in their lane. <laughs> and there's magistrates at your home. You know, they're called parents, right? And they have their lane. God created the state and the church and the family as different governments that have different functions under the all-governing God and we're all to self-govern. Where, where it seems like some people are saying, Dave, don't get too political. I don't want to get political, but I want them out of my lane. See, what happens is when the state overreaches, it comes into our lane and tells us how to worship. It comes into our homes and tells us how to run a family. It starts to get in. So I have no desire between you and I to be political. I have every desire to deal with what real people are dealing with according to biblical standards. And there's a lot of cuckoo-ness right now. So nonetheless, this topic. So is the Great Reset a grand reboot that, you know, godly people should join on and because it's a great opportunity to restart the world? Or is it a grave revolt, a godless rebellion, a grievous resistance to the things of God? Well, there probably are some good things in there somewhere, but there's a lot of things I'm concerned about. Let me share some scriptures. Let's go back to some timeless truths, just so that we can kind of get our heads straight about all that's going on. I'm going to take you to Isaiah 8. Verse 10, it says this, You nations, you distant lands, you world countries, you devise your strategy, you call your councils, you make your alliances, but this is going to be worthless and defeated and thwarted. You're going to get crushed. You propose your plans, 
but they're not going to stand. They're not going to succeed. You can plot and plan all you want, but nothing will come of it because ultimately you'll fail. For God is with us. This is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me. This is what he says in the strongest of terms. This is how he warned me not to follow the way of this people and these circumstances. Isaiah 8. Obviously, there's times in human history where God says, look, don't follow the world system. Don't be conformed to the ways of this world. Their plots and their plans are not ultimately going to succeed. Where's the Egyptian civilization today? It's not there. Where's the great Phoenician society? It's not there. Where's the great Greek? I mean, unbelievable. Have you been to the Parthenon? The Acropolis? They don't rule anything today. Maybe good salad dressing, but... <laughs> what about the Roman Empire? It's collapsed. You can plot and plan all your great ideas, but ultimately God is with us, his people. Job uh, chapter 5 says it this way, verse 12 and 13. God thwarts, he frustrates the plans and the pretensions of the crafty, the schemers, the conniving crooks, so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise, the know-it-alls in their craftiness and the schemes of the wily will be swept away. God knows what's going on. God knows the craziness that's going on. We don't need to fear. He's, he's in control. Let me give you a couple Proverbs. Proverbs 16, 9. It says, in, in their hearts, the mind of a person, humans plan their course. They devise their way. But the Lord ultimately establishes their steps, right? It's the Lord who decides, directs, and determines the steps. We can plan, but in the end, it's God who orders our steps. In Proverbs 19.21, it says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Said another way, Humans keep brainstorming options. They keep uh, proposing new ways to live. They continue experimenting on us like guinea pigs. They expose and then draft and then pontificate new schemes, new world orders, new great resets. But it's the Lord's purposes who are going to prevail. It's God's timeless truths that are always the winners. It's His advice that always succeeds. Man proposes, but God disposes. Uh, these are Proverbs. I'm just taking you back centuries, you know, so millennia, so that you know that this is not new. God always has his way in the end, and we are his, so we can have that confidence. Let me give you one psalm. Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, Lord my God, are the marvelous, wonderful works you've done and the things you've planned for us. None can compare with you. You have no equal. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, if I were to proclaim and recite all that you've done, they would be too many to declare, too numerous to list, too unending to count. It would never come to an end. God is that good. He has plans for us. No matter what's getting proposed out there, you don't need to panic. Uh, let's talk briefly, and maybe you can help me with this. There have been lots of supposed great resets in biblical history. I just want you to know, this is not new. We don't have to like panic and go, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. Well, it is the end of the world, so I guess there should be maybe, <laughs> maybe a little bit. We are near the end of the consummation of human history. There's not much left until he has to come back. Um, but I just want you to know, we're not so novel that we should get all narcissistic and think we're living in the hardest times ever. Um, there's a lot of resets. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Remember Adam and Eve? God had a plan for them. And they said, mm, we want to do a reset. Uh, we really want to eat from the tree of I decide, not you decide. Even though we could eat from any of the trees in the garden, the one forbidden one, the one you said, you can eat any, just not this one, but that's the one we wanted. 
and we think we know better. We're wiser. We're so elite. We've got a better plan. So they offered up their great reset, which was a great reject. I mean, it was terrible. And God, in his grace and mercy, allowed them to be moved out of the garden into time so that he could redeem them and give them a new opportunity. But the great reset was a great flub. The only reset that was worthwhile was the one God gave us. That's Genesis 3. By the time we get to Genesis 6, the world is so evil, the world order is so catastrophic, the world is in such a meltdown, they have their own plans. God's like, I'm going to do another reset. I'm going to flood the entire planet. Just so that you know, this is not the first time it's been worldwide. Worldwide, we're going to like do a major start over. That's how wicked people got from Genesis 3 to 6. So we start over. God with Noah and any of those who would get on board with God, which weren't many. And we do a do-over, a godly reset. And by the time we get to Genesis 11, what does 11 remind you of? The tower, right? The Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. You got to see the tower there? Never, I don't want you to forget, Genesis 11... The whole new world order got together and they're like, let's build a tower. We've got this great new plan. It's called the Great Reset. It involves everyone. The World Health Organization, the World Forum, the World Economic. All the world will be coming together to collude and we'll make a name for ourselves and we'll do it our way and we're gonna, it's going to be awesome. And there again, God's like, no. If you want to do it my way, that's great. If you don't, your plans are not going to succeed. And he scattered them, gave them different tongues, so they couldn't understand each other, and they couldn't like collude together. See, God's never been for European unions. He's never been for one world orders. He's never been for that. That doesn't mean he's not for national, you know, integration or dialogue or international cooperation. That's fantastic. But not collusion. So that's Genesis 3, Genesis 6, Genesis 11. Let's go to Exodus. You know, just let's get to another book in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, right? People of God decide they want to do it their way. They want to reset. They're taken into slavery in Egypt. In other words, the slavery that we're being proposed to get the mark of the beast so they can track us now, that's not new. And God had to reset and get the people out of uh, Egypt. Uh, when you get to Moses in Mount Sinai, he goes up and God gives him Ten Commandments. Why? Because the people were resetting on their own. And he's like, no, let me give you some... Let me give you one of the Ten Commandments that, I don't know, I hope this is not too convicting for you or too challenging, but it's challenging for me to think about just this week, and that is the Sabbath. You're to keep a Sabbath. You're, you're supposed to like not pause, rest, and glorify God when your work is done. You're supposed to do it every week, period, because he commands it. I don't know, but I was thinking to myself, sometimes I'm like, no, no, no. I have another reset. I'm going to use Sundays as a great opportunity to get ahead, and I'll start my work week early, and I'll get some stuff done, and I'll be busy and this, and I'm not going to go to church, and I'm not going to worship you. So I've got a reset that I want to do, because I think it's a better plan to get ahead. When God's like, no, you need to cease. You need to stop. You need to do what the doctor says. Go home and rest. You need to pause your cuckoo life and cram meaning into it by Sabbathing, by celebrating God, which, of course, you're doing today just by being here. So that's in Exodus. When you get to the Gospels, 
we see a, a great reset by God where he sends Christ to reject all religion and to help people know that they need a relationship with God. See, the world had done this incredible reset. Judaism has like, we've got, oh, we're going to do phylacteries on our head with verses in it. We're going to pray and we've got the wailing wall and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're going to, like, God had to, like, come in and say, your reset is a disaster. Let me give you a real reset. By the time you get to the book of Acts, you see that God does a reset in Pentecost. You think you're going to carry out the Christian life in your own power? Really? You think just your good, noble efforts are going to be sufficient? I don't think so. You're going to need my power. In fact, don't go anywhere till you're clothed with power from on high, not your power. God doesn't need a better you. He needs Christ working through you. Uh, we've been crucified with Christ. It's Christ who lives in us. Another reset. By the time you get to like Acts 15, we see another reset. Because they have a big church council and people are like, well, I think new believers need to be circumcised. I think new believers need to do the dietary food laws. I think uh, new believers have to do some of the stuff we've been working so hard on Judaism. We crave this incredible reset system. I was like, no. Christ alone, faith alone, scripture alone, God's glory alone. They don't need that. They need just to get their hearts right with God. Acts was a reset. Then you get to the letters, the epistles in here. Galatians. It's another reset. You're starting to get too legalistic. You're starting to get too religious. You're starting to get too rule-oriented. What happened to the grace? What happened to the freedom? You're going to need to go through Galatians. You're going to need another reset. Then I, I could take you through the whole canon. We don't have time, but let me take you to the very end. Revelation. You want to talk reset? You want to talk about the great reset that's coming? <laughs> really? I'm worried about people meeting in Switzerland? I don't think so. Look, I don't love everything that's going on. I think some of it's a disaster. But there's nothing new here. And ultimately, there'll be an ultimate reset where every person's going to stand before Jesus Christ, and you better get that one right. Because no matter how you choose to run your life or reset your life because you think you're so novel and clever and crafty, in the end, God has his ways. Well, we've seen some great resets in the Reformation, the 16th century. We had a couple great awakenings here in the 17th and 18th century that I thought were super resets to the world's cuckoo resets. Um, that's what I say I'm ready for. What about you? Right? The world is resetting, and we should be concerned. I'm concerned. But I'm not going to be fearful, and I don't want you to be either. I don't want to live scared. I want to do what we can do, but I also want to know this is not novel or new in history. Mankind has always thought they were smarter and craftier than God, and has always come up with different ways to like, and God's had to reset them, kick them out of the garden, do a flood, scatter them at Babel. Had to, and he will reset what's going on now. He reset it just with our last president. That was like a total disruption to the globalists. <laughs> so we got a four-year kind of reset, which is cool, right? But now it's going back to the, the globalists. And, and it's okay. We win in the end. So let me go back to where we started, and I'll close with this, and then you can, uh, we have a teach and talk format. So if you are online, you want to chat, or you have a question or a thought you want to add, or if you're here presently, you know, you can contribute as well. This is not just a uh, passive, uh, receive a, some pontification. This is a dialogue, right? Let's, let's learn together. But here's where we started. We started with on the worst night in human history, which wasn't the night that you found out that Trump lost or the electoral college failed. Or that was not the worst <laughs> night in human history, whatever you think politically. It was the night Jesus was betrayed. On that night, he said to his disciples, I've told you these things. I've been candid with you. I forecasted my death. 
I talked about betrayal. I dealt with your sinfulness so that in me, in a personal relationship with me, you'd have peace. Even though that very night he knew chaos was going to unfold, you can have peace in a relationship with me. Because I've, I told you, in this world, in this godless, fallen, liberal left, controlling, cruel place, you're going to have trouble. You are. You're going to have trials and tribulations. You're, you're going to suffer and have sorrows. This isn't your home. Your true citizenship is in heaven. I've told you that. You're going to have trouble here. But take heart. Don't fear. Be strong. Be courageous. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I know how the world system works. I know how the new world order happens. I know people are going to come up with the craziest. Rousseau was a nutcase. Marx was off the beat. The new world order has its own bizarre peculiarities. I I've overcome all that. You may have to endure some of it. You may have to get creative. You're going to have to stick together. You're going to have to stay dependent on me. You're going to still have to walk in the spirit so you don't lose your mind. But I've overcome the world. We win in the end and there will be a final reset and the one they're talking about is not the one you need to worry about. It's that one that's coming. If you have Christ, you win. Amen?